Andrew. So Andrew's running off and he's going to burst you into the recruiting equipment that maybe we won't use. Um, welcome to 2020, and this is the first KW Lug presentation of 2020, given that it's the sixth day of January. Uh, in terms of announce, I, I didn't think I was going to prepare anything. So, um, in terms of announcements, what I know is that we've got, mm, we need one presentation for February. And at this point, I don't care whether it's advanced or beginner level. Um, so if anybody, does anybody have anything that they'd be interested in either presenting or seeing? Or both? Yeah? I'd like to see something about mixed sauce. Mm. I, I know that that's yeah. a problem. So next, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a presentation maybe a year ago or not. Huh? Um, but yeah, so does anybody want to do another refresher on mixed sauce? If you'd like to see it. Yeah? I can do that plus the SSH, but not initial, maybe a couple months of <laughs> Yeah, did we not schedule, we scheduled you in for cluster SSH? I think. I think we scheduled you in already. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me know when it is so I can show up. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lori. Well, the trailer can ask me anything. You want to ask me anything? Somebody, somebody sits in front and just. So oh, is it like, ask me, ask ask me anything and everybody responds, or ask or, me anything and only Tim responds? I, I <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Tim can ask questions. I see. Okay. I don't know, maybe some little sure. water or a dam or... Well, sure. I, how about a variation on solitaire, two-person solitaire, where one person, you play solitaire, but as soon as a person misses a move, then the second person has a play. That sounds like so it's starting to get competitive. Okay. So you put, you, no, no, but I'm saying, you, you, you ask me anything in the front of the room. Right, you can answer. And then if I'm like, I don't know, if anybody else knows, they get the... I didn't play the version of that game, but it involved whiskey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it might be sure. because it's like you didn't how remember people, the extra command line option. So how many people would be interested in the sort of ask me anything half presentation? Yeah. A little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Try. Okay, let's try it out. Yeah. Sure. That'll be February. And then we were okay for March. I don't remember about April. Yeah, so then I think we're okay for at least March, but then if you have at any time, any ideas about what you'd like to see or what you'd like to present, we're always looking for presentations. It's bad to be the day before and not have something. John. Um, so it makes nice to see like maybe an introduction to some of the DNS server um, services. DNS. Or mm -hmm. maybe touch on the different uh, secure DNS options. I think there's a couple. I think one maybe has one now, but it feels like there wasn't. So, so someone's couple. How does configured secure DNS, or what it is, or the the one the ones that exist, and why we chose whatever one we chose. Right. Does anybody have any expertise or ability to pick up some expertise in secure DNS? I'm giving the first talk, so. <laughs> no. Okay. So let's put that on the mailing list, and then DNS servers in general, maybe. Any other suggestions or ideas? Yeah, Lord. DNS mask. DNS mask. Part which is related, but I, if I was going to give that talk in principle, it would not be so much on secure DNS, but fun things you can do with DNS mask. That still sounds cool. I would vote for that. <laughs> I'd like that. If you just volunteer for a talk. <laughs> Sorry. At some point. <laughs> Probably not until April or May is the next slot, but you can go with it. Okay, I'll talk with you about that. Yes. Okay, anything else? Okay, Stephen, do you want to talk about legal planning? Uh, I can talk about that now or I can talk about that when I talk, whatever is better for you. Okay, uh, so uh, every year, the Free Software Foundation has a conference that they run in Boston. And Boston is so far from here. Uh, so I'm gonna run the exact same conference here uh, at the Delta Hotel in Uptown Waterloo. Um, uh, it's going to be in March. I don't have the date in front of me because it's on the 14 and 15. You already know? Yeah, whatever he said, 14 and 15. Um, uh, 
It's on exactly the same dates because we're going to live stream all of the content from there to here. Uh, it's not that I don't trust you. Yeah, 14 and 15. <laughs> I just want to look at my own. Um, yeah. So the idea is that we haven't, part of my reason for doing this is that we haven't really had a lot of good event stuff in Southern Ontario since KW's new Linux Fest died a horrible death. Um, there have been attempts and stuff. This is probably also going to not work, but like this is my version of trying to make it work. Uh, so we know the talks will be good because the talks at Libre Planet are always good. I can't tell you what they will be yet because they haven't been announced yet. I will, I will make that known to the mailing list when I know, um, which should be soon. Um, registration is open now. It's pay what you want. I would like you to pay enough that I can pay the hotel. But if you don't, I have to pay the hotel anyway, so please come. Just come. I, I don't really care. That's mostly, that's mostly it. We'll have probably local lightning talk something and local hallway track and local beer track afterwards and all that fun stuff. And then good talks from people who know what they're talking about, also about Unit Linux and about ethics and technology generally. And there's always a big grab bag of talks. Sorry, where did you say it was going to be for local? So it's going to be at the Delta Hotel in Waterloo um, on Herb Street, right, right, right in uptown Waterloo. So very easy to get to on the train. Oh yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. If you pay me nothing, you can still come. But if you pay me something, then I can afford to do it again next year. Uh, that's basically it. So are you looking for like sponsors? Are you looking for organizational help? Yeah. So I will need. I, I, if people are interested in helping, I will need. Um, a uh, few volunteers to do things like room monitoring, like the basic stuff that we have to do uh, at this kind of event. So I probably need like five or six people total, and I have one so far. Uh, so if people are interested in, in day of volunteering, um, it, you can have a discount of however much you want to take off of what you give them. Uh, <laughs> um, so that would be great. Uh, if for some reason, you do work for a company that would be interested in sponsoring. That would also be great because then we can pay for some of the beer instead of making people buy all of it themselves. Um, do you have information on a, a site? Somewhere? I do. The website is 2020.libreplanet.ca. Um, yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any announcements they would either like to? They would like to make. Okay, and without further ado, here's John who's going to tell us everything we need to know about SSL. And he's going to put his. I will put my mic down, yeah. Indeed, I am John, uh, and I will be giving a short primer on certificates. Uh, and I will talk about uh, TLS and Cypher Suites, possibly, and then give a quick exam um, demonstration of how you can get um, an HTTPS certificate with Let's Encrypt. So, is that all right? Uh, so, we'll start with just very simply, what are certificates? So you have metadata, which is going to be the at least the validity period and who issued the certificate. That could be the same certificate itself. You have a body, which is usually a name and what you're allowed to do with the key that's in a certificate. Um, I'll maybe mention that in a second. Uh, and there's a signature on the object. <coughs> so I don't know if that's very legible, but yeah, that's what I said. So you have your issued by, utility from to, uh, name, usage info, and a signature. Most of the certificates you're going to use are not going to be trusted. Uh, the only ones that are trusted by your machine, that's going to be in your, either in your browser's trust store, which is a collection of root certificates, or your system's uh, 
they're not the ones you're going to see in when you go to a website. So certificates can form a chain, which can enable trust. So we have certificate Joe Demo that's issued by A, uh, or A that's issued by Joe Demo. A is signed by a certificate that's in your trust store, either in your browser or your system. Then it can chain those together to uh, prove that this is a trustworthy certificate. So, just a quick recap on the basics of what a certificate is. It's signed data with certain fields and it can be trusted. What can they do so far is they can be changed in order to become trusted. And I'm going to talk about how we use them at Escrypt uh, to secure vehicles, our vehicle access. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> can you have uh, double chaining or multiple chaining? Yes. So when I go to, uh, when I demonstrate uh, what Let's Group does, I can show you their uh, chain. Actually, I can pull that up right now because it is interesting. Um, still learning my Pop OS key shortcuts. And crypt. They have a nice graphic here. Aha. So, because when, they, when Let's Encrypt, if you don't know, uh, they were um, an initiative by a number of companies, including uh, Mozilla, and I don't remember all the founders, but uh, they came together to make it easy for people to get free automated certificates. Uh, when they first started, they didn't have a route that was trusted by anyone. Um, they made their, their own route, but uh, it's the ISRG route, I believe, and that goes to the this one here. But anyways, they wanted to, to be trustworthy right off the bat with all kinds of devices. Like, um, even, I, I tested even on my uh, um, my Wii. I could go to the browser, I could go to my website on my Wii, and it also showed that it trusted the cert. Um, so lots of lots of devices, lots of trust stores out there in the wild. So uh, they needed a solution that would work when they launched. So this is where uh, Ident Trust came in. They agreed to cross sign. That's what's happening in this image. If you guys can see it, uh, the Ident, Ident Trust CAX3 root, which is a root that's well trusted on lots of devices, uh, signed um, at least one of these. I guess there's some of them that have been. Uh, deactivated now, so our current Let's Encrypt root is Authority X3. Uh, it is signed by both Ident Trust and the ISRG root, which is the Let's Encrypt root. Um, and when I say it's signed by both, it actually is two different certificates uh, that use the same key. So I'm not, in this talk, I'm not gonna go into what uh, a public private key are. I'm just, just know that a public key has a matching private key that is kept secret, and you can use a public key, you can verify someone has access to a private key with the public key. Is that a good way of, I may not be the best way of saying that, but um, yeah, so a certificate is going to have, a, is going to mention a public key, and when you, um, when you have a certificate signed by another certificate, it's signing using its private key. So here we show ident trust uh, trust the Let's Encrypt authority. So it, there is a version of this certificate that is signed by this certificate's private key. And there's also a version of the certificate that is signed by this private key. And actually, it'd be more interesting to look at a site. So uh, CRT.sh is a fantastic site. It lets you search for any certificate that's in a transparency record, which is most certificates these days. So I'm going to look up steelcomputers.com. You see we have, a, I have a lot of certificates from different people with this. I'm gonna to go to this certificate and I can see, this screen is not. Okay, so here is, a, here is my certificate. Has a, oh, no, this is not my certificate. <laughs> Sorry, just a moment. Why is that not my certificate? Oh. 
It was. Okay, sorry. This is my steel computer certificate. You can see it has a subject, common name is steelcomputers.com. And then, like I said, it has an issuer. So the issuer's common name is Let's Encrypt Authority X3. Um, and there's a lot of other information. So we have the public key. This is an RSA key, so it has a modulus. It has an exponent. Uh, and then we have these extensions that tell you what you're allowed to do with the certificate. So this one's allowed to be used to create a digital signature as well as key and cipher moves, I believe is similar to key agreement. You're trying to make a shared secret. I might be mistaken of that. Um, it can be used for authentication. So um, you're authenticating the server. It can also be used for client authentication, which means um, when you create a secure connection to, say, even this site here, search.sh, it says it's secure because there's a certificate there. So that's the standard um, flow. You, you get a certificate from the server and then you can verify that it's trusted. You can also present a certificate when you're making that connection. If the server asks for one, it can be optional or it can be required. Uh, so anyway, this extended key use is just saying you can use it for client authentication as well. Um, and then uh, we see here, this certificate cannot be used as a certificate authority, so I can't sign additional certificates underneath this. But if I go up to its issuer, I'm used to being on a lot higher resolution screen. So bear with me a moment. So if you go to the issuer, you can see this one uh, is signed by the Internet Security Research Group, that's ISOGX1. And there's also another copy of this certificate, like I mentioned earlier, that is signed by DST Root, um, which I don't know the company that does this, but this is the one that's well trusted. So just to recap, the question was, can you have uh, I believe the question was, can you have it signed by multiple parties? And my explanation was, you can, but you actually have two different certificates that have the same key. Does that answer your question? Any other questions before we move on? Cool. So, so yeah. if, if one party is compromised, then you still, uh, <clears throat> because of multiple sign, you still can trust the uh, certificate? Or? So your question is, if one party is compromised, so if one root is compromised? Yeah, there were cases where the CA certificate authorities were, yeah, were compromised, yeah? So then if you have multiple signatures, um, it's still certificate valid if one party is compromised? Uh, so the question, um, if, if you change to multiple parties, and one is compromised, is your certificate still valid? That would depend on the chain that you present. So you, when you make a connection, or so, um, you have to, as far as I'm aware, you can only use one chain at a time. So your server could choose to chain to one or the other based on not much, because all you'd have is a, uh, what's called a SNI, a, a server name identifying header. So it tells you what serve. so before you make a connection to a, a client, you don't have much to go with. Uh, so you pretty much have to know ahead of time what you want to chain to. So if you choose to chain to um, the DST root and it's, and it's revoked, and the client's trust store has been updated to say that it's revoked, then they, it should not uh, finish the connection. It should find that you're untrustworthy in the fourth connection. Unless, of course, you go to a, on a browser and you uh, go to bad SSL. And try wrong host. So this is what you get in Firefox. You get a warning. Um, you want to see more? Oh. 
if. Um, so in this case, it's bad to serve domain. But you asked if it's revoked. So let's look at revoked. Error revoked certificate. Actually, in that case, Firefox will not let you uh, proceed, which is probably a good behavior. Um, so now that's probably the end entity certificate that's revoked. So back to this, uh, I have my diagram here. These at the end are the, are the certificates that your server is going to present. And typically, those are the ones that are revoked. <coughs> um, you can, well, you, you definitely can revoke an intermediate certificate too. Uh, but revoking roots has to be done by whoever manages your trust store. So if you're using the trust store on Linux, um, I guess you'd have to do an app get update or something, or your package manager might update those from time to time. Um, otherwise, if, if you're using the one in the browser, that's, yeah, it might, Mozilla's uh, would have to do that. There has been, I remember there was one in the middle, there was a CA in the Middle East. Um, I don't know if it actually got trusted by anyone, but uh, it was found that they were doing um, spying on, like helping governments spy on their citizens, so uh, a lot of people uh, raised concerns about even uh, ver like, trusting that uh, root. Question? So there's cross-signing, which is an interesting hack around this problem of being able to have multiple trusts is that you um, you can have something that signs something. Okay, you can have a certificate authority sign a certificate authority. So even if the set one of the certificate authorities, the upper one, the one that got signed, you know whatever became detrusted, then your root of trust would go down to the first certificate authority through the same untrusted link up. Because you know, so say CA one is trusted by you and CA2 is trusted by you, but you're worried that CA2 may become untrusted for some reason. Well, if CA1 signs CA2's certificate, you, they can both issue you certs, but if CA2 is thrown out and says, you're no longer trustworthy, you can say, that's fine, I'm just a regular certificate. Here's here's my trust rate. You know, here's my chain of trust. It goes back to somebody you do trust. So it would function just the same. Okay, so you're saying that you can have uh yeah. Assuming I'm not going to repeat everything I said for the list. recording, but... <laughs> yeah, it, ignoring um, verification lists and blacklists and all that stuff. So which don't no, get used often. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> uh, TLS is so terrible. <laughs> well, this isn't TLS. Well, no, well no, specific no. chains are sort of terrible. <laughs> like, they're right now. If, you've they, said, if you said you trust both of them, I don't think that's a bug. Well, no, no, no. But so right now, you could... If I'm a CA, I can sign another certificate, which you don't trust. And that certificate can sign a, another certificate. Which oh, hold on for a moment, because that certificate has to have a, it, you can't just sign a random certificate, because that certificate already has a signature. So usually this root, like, like this root here, I don't know if my cursor is showing up, yep. it is self-signed. So its issuer is itself. Yeah, you can't no, just come along and sign it. it. You can make a certificate change that. They would have to be a party to this, and they'd have to make a, du a duplicate of their own certificate that goes to you. Yeah. Well, yeah, cross certification requires that middle party. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be a change. It would be self -signed. Used, and they both Oh, but I'm saying, I guess you can sign. just arbitrarily make that because it's the signer that, that, that makes the certificate. Yeah. So what you said might actually make sense. I'd have to think. Yeah, it's, it's how Let's Encrypt started out. Okay. But but it's hmm. it's it, it, if it's blacklisted, for example, the second certificate authority gets discovered they're working with some government agency of some untrustworthy government, and they're like, well, you know, Chrome will just say, nope, we're just not even we don't see that cert, it doesn't exist in our world, and then you know it'll it could break the chain anyhow. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions or? What's the difference between eScript? You said that's a free certificate issuer. Uh, Let's Encrypt. Oh, it sorry. Is a, yeah, is a free Let's, service to yeah. search. And VeriSign, for example. What's the difference between this? And VeriSign does not have an automated, at least didn't have an automated way of getting a certificate. Or are you saying uh, is VeriSign not, uh, that's a paid one? Yeah, I mean, what's what's the value? I mean, it, it, when someone has to choose between VeriSign and uh, Let's Encrypt. I guess that's that can be controversial. I, so if, if you don't like that Let's Encrypt enforces a three-month uh, 
term. You can't you can't issue a study as much for more than uh, three months at a time. You have to renew regularly. A question or an answer? Answer ish. So uh, Verisign would be able to sell you a wild card or a DV certificate, whereas Let's Encrypt doesn't do wild cards. So Let's Encrypt does now do wild cards. They don't do EV. Um, but EV, yeah, not not many people <coughs> care about EV anymore since you don't get the the, the extra special lock. What um, is EV? Uh, sorry, so, uh, EV is extended verification certificates. It's where if, if I were to go to DigiCert and ask them to really make sure that I'm me. Um, like if you go to PayPal, it'll say signed by PayPal. You, you used to you yeah. used to get like a in Firefox you used to get like a green blob on the left that would actually give you the name of the company. So yeah, so let's try going to BMO and see like, if they have. I don't, I don't think it does anymore. I don't believe so. I don't think any browser does that anymore. Infections. No, no, that's not. That's not, that's that's not the wrong, you got to put the lock. That's the wrong yeah. one. Oh, whoops. Um, it just says to issue the bank once you're on. If I go to. If you, if you dig into the arrow, it might still be there, but like it's not a nice big obvious fob anymore. So mm -hmm. no one's going to pay for that. Yeah, so. So why did they get rid of that? that? I'm curious. Because no one in the, well, so I shouldn't say no one. Because Google and possibly Mozilla, which is all of the people at this point, uh, <laughs> didn't necessarily believe that the CAs were doing anything when they said they were extended validating you. Because for example, there were cases where people were able to get EV certificates without even being the company in question. Okay. At which point, there's really, like, why are we privileging our UI? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Why are we privileging in our UI this information that isn't actually, right? If the CAs were 100% were always doing their job, it's like a neat feature to have, but, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, in theory, EV, there was, there were more, uh, there's more done to verify that you're you, and you were rewarded with a special icon when you went to their site. Uh, but today, I, Chrome and Firefox both don't do anything special for EV certs. Um, so it doesn't really make much sense. Uh, if you were already using EV, you might continue to pay for it because you can use their EV route. You, can, you may have already pinned their EV route. So people that have already gone to pay for this might continue if they have that pinned in certain places. Oh, and just uh, pinning is you can force clients to only use a certain, uh, a certain route if you're worried about another route com being compromised. And there are different ways you can do that. But there's lots of like old school IT people and companies that believe that if you pay for it, there's someone to sue, so it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> like there, there, there's companies that just we have to pay somebody for it, we can't use it for much. Well, if you buy a certificate from Verisign, you get a nice little gift that you yeah. put on your website too that says that it's yeah. there. So no one else can yeah. use that. <laughs> <laughs> but you won't get any yeah. <laughs> Uh, but but yeah, um, I'm sure a lot of companies are, are doing different things to try to have the value add over less and Um But in most cases, if you're just trying to, to get a secure connection to something, it does the trick. Uh, and you can pin, um, well, I guess, yeah, so there might be some cases where you are worried that Let's Encrypt might have a flaw in its API and someone might be able to also get uh, a cert issued for your service and they might be able to man mail your connection. Uh, they have had some breaches, but they're quickly patched and uh, any incorrect certificates are usually revoked. You can also keep an eye on it yourself and you can go to, uh, you can revoke certificates that you don't think should have been issued um, through their API as well. Um, yes? Yeah, that's if you want to deal with the public certificate shape, but if you're really that concerned, you want to pin things down. I mean, just create a self side cert and say I only trust this. Like, you know, as in you create your own chain of trust. There's nothing stopping you from designing a system where you, you've got your, you're not using a public chain of trust except if you need devices which aren't part of your system to trust the things in your system. Yeah, then you need to change to something like that. So, yeah. Uh, so, so, like, if you're paranoid, you can definitely. Um, have your own route. You can definitely use tools like OpenSSL to make your own route and, and create uh, certificates off of that. Uh, if you don't need to have a public one, like if you're doing something like we do with, with uh, vehicles and embedded, e and embedded devices, we can just provision a trust store with our route only. Um, and you can do that with 
front finder, there's a there's a nice uh, Java uh, application that uh, is a fully featured uh, CA. And you can be Yes. Yeah. What is it? EB. It's like EJDCA. So I'll plug that. EBJCA, I think. I played around with it. You can get a Docker container. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the it. open source CA. Um, so this is a pretty nice tool. If you need a fully featured CA, if you just need something quick and dirty, OpenSSL command line interface will do the trick. Um, yeah. Um, that's that may not work for you if you do if your if your clients are usually on browsers. You don't uh, and you don't want to pay. I'm not sure what you have to pay to get an intermediate from a from uh, someone. That, that's another reason, I guess, to have other CAs because they might you might be able to buy an intermediate from them. Although that's probably questionable. I'm not going to maybe I'm not sure that's true. So how how, you, how important is the identity? Because I remember a few years back. <coughs> With very signed, they said that you have to provide the proof that you are who, who you say you are. So, uh, I mean, is the identity right now so uh, so important? Uh, so, proving your so the question is how important is it to be able to prove your identity? Yeah, uh, very important. So, Let's Encrypt does this by uh, they've designed a few different challenges, um, so they can if you. They, they've decided if you have control of the DNS of a, for your domain, they will issue a certificate to you. So you can prove this by pointing it to a web server uh, that, that you can put a challenge, and they'll give you a challenge and you put the response on your web server. You can also prove it by setting a text record on your, on your uh, DNS, and they will check for that, a record that they've asked you to put. And that's how, uh, that's what they do. And so that's what does automatic, uh, or automated verification of identity. Um, if you're dealing with someone like DigiCert, they will have customer service work with you to, to, to get something that proves who you are. We've, I've had to do that recently. Um, I was in a rush to try to get an old server up that was, uh, I knew I had clients that had pinned um, a certain route. So I really needed a, a DigiCert certificate that changed to a specific DigiCert route, um, but they, Told me I had to get a bunch of documents because uh, they had to re-verify my identity to get a new cert for some reason. Um, and the only phone, uh, anyway, I had a lot of fun with that because the phone number uh, that they had found on Yellow Pages, which was a trusted source for Digi Cert, uh, went to our old general manager who did not work there anymore, so that was not very useful. Um, but yeah, the the way that uh, CAs will uh, ver verify your identity will vary. Um, I'm sure a lot more are probably offering automated solutions now that that's kind of convenient. You can just have a cron job that just does something and, and proves your identity and get your cert. Um, but uh, I guess I can say it, it, it is very important that it's a, a trustworthy way of verifying your identity. If it wasn't, then uh, people like Chrome and Mozilla and Windows are going to not trust your root if you're doing things that are suspicious. So the question about SSL certificates, when you're doing, say, WordPress sites on your own and you're doing your self-hosting mm -hmm. and you're putting your DNS and all that. So I, I've done it and the, like you're saying, it says not secure website, even you, even though you have an SSL certificate. So it means that the certificate wasn't working or that you need to go manually and, and point the SSL certificate to your DNS and name server? Like um, that's the way it works? So I don't know what, WordPress, um, you need to have the server uh, have access to uh, have access to the key in some way. That can be through like an HSM, or usually it's a flat file with your key and then your search. Um, so, so the question was, um, what ha what happens if you get a cert and it's not showing it's trusted? Right. So, assuming you've already done the step where you've uh, given your server, I'm not sure how the, that server works. Um, like Nginx, you can just give it, you can just give it the files. Uh, hot proxy the same. Um, for web ones, they, they probably have something or they may have a service where they can get the cert for you. Um, if you configured this and you're still having a problem, you might have um, some of your files not being served HTTPS. For instance, if you're using jQuery from a CDN that's not HTTPS, your browser is still going to say it's not secure because not all the content is, is uh, served through HTTPS. Uh, so imagine if someone is man in the middle in your connection, they let all your your traffic to your web server go through uh, without terminating SSL, 
but TLS, but uh, anyway. Um, but you're also going to jQuery, they can, uh, they can intercept that and serve any kind of malicious content they want through that side channel, uh, which is why your browser is going to say it's still not uh, uh, secure. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. And then another, uh, building on that, there's an awesome site. There's a few awesome sites for this. Uh, SSL Labs will give you a report card uh, and tell you all kinds of things that are good or not so good on your uh, setup. So they show, if you elect, if you don't click, the, oh, the default, I guess, is to not show your results. But if you're, fear, if you're fearless, you can uncheck that and it'll put you on a board. So I can see that this site just recently did a test. I'm gonna shrink this a bit. They got a B because their key exchange did not support uh, forward secrecy. So that's, um, I'll just go down to this report. They're gonna give you a bunch of Cypher suites, which is uh, when you connect to the server uh, in the TLS handshake, it's gonna tell, the server's gonna tell you what algorithms it supports for encryption. And then you're gonna tell the server, probably actually, maybe the opposite. They, you, you tell the server which ones you support, it'll say what it supports and what it would prefer you use. Something like that. But anyway, here's, here's an example of uh, this test. It shows all these different algorithms that are supported, like this here, TLS with elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman exchange, ECDHE, RSA, with, so this is one of the options. And then these ones are green because, uh, ah, ephemeral, sorry, the E is ephemeral, uh, which is important. So this, is, this algorithm is going to create a set of keys that are not long-lived which means as long as both the server and the client are playing nice and they will delete this key at the end of the session, and even if someone captured all the traffic between your client and server, the key that can decrypt that traffic can never be found again um, because of uh, this algorithm. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, they don't enforce that or they don't give enough of these algorithms, so it looks like this site, uh, let's, uh, SL Labs has capped this particular site as B. Um, check out this site, point it at your bank, point it at different things. We'll tell you um, if they're susceptible to fun attacks like Poodle or Logjam or uh, some like downgrade attacks where you can, they can, you can uh, as a man in the middle, you can trick the client or server to negotiate a, a, a less uh, secure algorithm. Um, anyway, yeah, so this site uh, will give you all that and give you a big uh, article on each one of those problems, if you have one, on why you're vulnerable to this and how you can fix it. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're not getting, if you're seeing your server not secure and you are serving uh, a certificate, point this at it and see what happens. Hopefully that's useful. Thank you. No problem. Um, getting low on time, I'm gonna just quickly, or when am I supposed to finish? What's that, right at the hour? No, a little bit earlier than that, so that Stephen can get served. So a little right. bit before the hour. Okay, I'm going to just the hour. zip through what our uh, what we do with certificates. Um, I'm not going to use my slides because it was made in PowerPoint. A lot of these slides are made in PowerPoint. They don't open in LibreOffice, so I have a PDF here. And can I full screen? Uh, whoever's running Pop OS, is there what's the full screen shortcut? It's usually up above. F11? <coughs> yes, it is. I guess it's not popular. All right. Uh, and I want to hide this. Ah, good enough. So we offer um, a secure vehicle access slash vehicle sharing solution. And we thought the best way to offer this, uh, we had a customer come to us and say, hey, this is what we think we want you to, uh, we want to have made, and then we came back and said, we think we should, um, we, we think we should design it a little bit differently and leverage PKI. So a lot of these slides are us going back to them and saying, hey, um, this would be a better solution. I've, I've gotten the okay to talk about this. Um, nothing, yeah, anyway. So what we do is we have a, um, back when we were at Trustpoint, we had a uh, CA that uh, instead of using X509 certificates, so everything I've talked to up till now has been X509 certificates. Um, they're great, but they're a little bit, um, a little big when you want to go embedded. You can get them down smaller if you choose to use something like uh, elliptic curve uh, keys. They're a lot smaller than RSA 
Um, but your certificate size is probably still going to be about 500 bytes. When we use the trust point technology, uh, and then uh, we use an M2M certificate, which there's a there's an RTF draft uh, out there for that, but that's uh, expired and no one's going to, it's not actually going to get. Um, I don't know where I'm looking for. Anyway, um, with uh, M2M certificates, we can get certs down to like 150 to 180 bytes, which is really nice for embedded and uh, do, uh, uh, transmitting over things like NFC, where your, uh, your maximum size is pretty small. Uh, so we had we already had this CA. And is this actually visible? Oh, what? Oh, it is just small. You have five. Ah, that's what I wanted. Thank you. Um, so we had we already had a CA that we offered at that point for these uh, smaller certificate chains and certificates, um, and we would enroll uh, the user's smartphone as well as their vehicle into our PKI. So we give uh, at manufacturer we would give the vehicle a certificate um, and. At sign-in, we would give the phone actually a pair of certificates, but um, we give a phone certificate, and they all chain up to our route that we would we would give a route to each of our customers. So whatever OEM, uh, so we haven't we don't actually have this in the field yet, but we would yet yeah, give this to uh, we would have a cert for each OEM, um, and when you go to unlock your car, um, the vehicle can look at your certificate. So you make a handshake that involves uh, transmitting your certificate to each other. Uh, you can each see by chaining your certificate up to the root um, that you're both valid entities in our system. And then you can trust the information in the certificate about what uh, you're allowed to do. Um, so what we would do is present signed objects, uh, so a uh, permission that's signed by the key mentioned in the phone certificate to the car, and that and the car can look at that permission, verify that it's signed by its owner, and then unlock the car or uh, allow you to get in the trunk, start the, start the vehicle, uh, or if you, oh, sorry. A bit out of order. Yeah. You, so that can also uh, that permission can also be sent to a friend. So in the in the permission signed data, we can say, hey, this is for this person, and it's signed by the owner of the vehicle. Uh, and that can all be verified offline. So if you're in a parking garage, you're in the middle of the desert, um, you can always access this without either the phone or the vehicle requiring connectivity. Um, they only need connectivity when they're first uh, enrolled in the system, which is either at the factory or when you download the app. Um, so I find that's kind of a neat feature of our solution, and it's powered by um, just a tweak of the same, almost the same kind of infrastructure that's used to get to a uh, site secure. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to say with that. And if there's any questions, so, then I'm, oh, yes. So who's signing who? I think I got lost there. Sure. So I mean, smartphones and I have cars, and we have your CA. Mm -hmm. And now, how how is it the case that I can use my smartphone to unlock my car, and I can't unlock kids? So we have an enrollment process. So there's an enrollment into the system, and then actually, when you buy your car, uh, there is an enrollment process to say you're the owner of the car, and there's a secret that would have been given to you. Uh, in the material for the vehicle. Uh, and the question was, how does the vehicle know uh, if a permission uh, is signed by the right person? And so now, let's say that I want Jeff to be able to use my car, so then I need that secret that I was originally given to say, uh, please make a certificate for Jeff's smartphone. Your the question phone, is what, oh, um, your phone signs a certificate for your friend, and then that, that allows it to chain through. Your car your car trusts your phone, so now your phone is creating a certificate for your friend's phone. You can then restrict it further, say you know your friend can only use it you know one day, 
spread them out all the time. It could work that way, but we don't. We actually don't use certificates for permissions. We totally couldn't. Oh, I thought you did. Um, we just it's just a binary object that's our own protocol. Uh, so we we've defined a special binary object that we sign using the owner's certificate. Um, and the, the, that object has a reference to the certificate that uh, uh, the sort of the common name of the certificate that is, be, it is going to unlock the car. Okay, when I was talking to Mark about it like a year or two ago, it was going to be two certificates. Well, the friend has a certificate as well, but the permission, okay. we generate lots of permissions, okay. and you can have overlapping permissions. We decided to go with just a, a straight binary, our, our own object. And that also lets us have it a little bit be a little bit smaller. So our permission objects are I don't know the size, but they're quite small. So, so of the everybody trusts they use uh, your company's certificate, right? So the rule of trust is uh, generated from is from the company. So you're asking if everyone trusts our company's root? Yeah. And no, only the only this only the entities that we uh, we, we control all the entities in this. So the vehicles yeah. are provisioned to trust our root. Yes. Um, and, and the phones and the phone. actually, for HTTPS, we use a different cert. Uh, so the phone doesn't trust uh, the the phone actually doesn't trust our root, but the code the, our application yes. trusts our root. Yeah. In the context of this operation. Yes. So. The first question is like, will I be able to use my car or sell my car to somebody else when your company is already not in business? Mm. Mm. That's the question <laughs> number one. The question number two, are you protected from hacking? Because uh, as far as I understand, if I get your rule, I'll be able to create any certificates and open and use any car. So, Presumably it's offline. <laughs> So uh, the root it would be offline and air gapped. Uh, we actually have intermediates. I didn't want to get too specific, but uh, we don't sell soft, We don't sell it as a service. Like we sell a library for the phone, a library for the ECU, and the back end. Actually, we give it to the customer, and they stand it up. So if we uh, if we go to business, they have uh, they have the solutions. So so the client means is the manufacturer of the car. Yeah, so it would, it would probably be an OEM or uh, someone who's doing fleet management would also that also use our service. So basically, if they go out of business, <coughs> yes, <laughs> I, it's still the point is like uh, I'm owner of the car, but the root of the trust in this car is not from me. It's not generated by me. Then you just replace your ECU. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Then you replace your ECU. Or you just use the key. Ah, uh, yeah. we actually, I don't, there's not enough time to go into too much into our, our, our solution, but we actually have thought of uh, what happens if we have an untrust, we, we from the from the beginning, yeah. uh, if our key sharing server goes totally malicious, we want to limit what it could do and it cannot steal the car. If the root, because we have a mechanism for resetting ownership, there is something we call a master recovery signer that's off the root uh, that would theoretically be able to generate a, uh, to be able to take retake ownership of a car. Yeah. Um, but it is very difficult to, but yeah, that would be a system that hopefully the OEM agrees to air gap or put in some sign behind some special process. Um, yeah, uh, but I think I'm almost out of time. I want to do a quick demo if I still do have time. Sure. So, just going to bring up uh, my CentOS box here. On here twice, but that's okay. All right, so I'm going to so there's a few different tools to uh, get a certificate from Let's Encrypt. Uh, they published the API, um, and it, it just, it's very clear how you can make your own um, tool that conforms to their requirements. Uh, the most popular one is probably called Certbot, but I like this one, uh, Acme SH, for a couple of reasons. It does not require that you run to this root, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and it supports elliptic curve certs, which are, I mentioned earlier, uh, elliptic key, the curve keys are a bit smaller. Um, so if you check out um, acme.sh and 
you install. It's going to install it into my home folder, and it's going to have cron job. So now, every day at wait, who reads cron? That's every day, every day at twelve forty-nine. Okay. Good morning. It's going to run Acme SH and update any certs that may have expired. Or maybe coming up to expiration, actually. It's going to happen every 60 days, even though the certs are good for 90 days. It gives you a 30-day window to notice if, uh, if it didn't work. All right, so I'm going to my server again so I get Acme SH in my environment. Looks not great on this size. That's not readable as, ah, no, it's not that readable. Um, I'm going to ask it to issue a certificate. I'm going to use this option standalone, which means it's going to stand up a web server in order to um, meet the challenge that Let's Encrypt is going to issue. And I'm going to ask for certificate, for example, .com. And it's going to find out very quickly that I don't own the example.com. And it doesn't work. But if I did something that I do own, like this, Yes. Uh, should work. So I'm asking for I'm asking for a certificate for a single domain. Um, you can also ask for a number of domains, and in some circumstances, you can get a wildcard cert. Uh, there may be some special criteria. Oh. And I didn't make the correct sacrifices demo gods. That didn't go through. Let's try that.jstealkw.ca. So before, um, yeah, that's working. Okay, so I have a wildcard entry on a few of my uh, hosts that should put all records to that box. So when it put up a web server, it was able to serve a challenge. I was actually tell you what it does. So downloads. So it's verifying that the jsteel.ca. Probably wanted to do something like debug to see this in more detail, but I'll do it once again just to uh, so quickly. So it, it echoed out the certificate that we got. If we were to take this certificate. And a uh, new tab in, is it Control-T? The button. default terminal? Oh, there's a button. Oh, that's an option. Okay, X clip, oh, there's that cert. We can put that in OpenSL, X509, text. And it will tell, it'll give us a bit of a nicer representation of that. Control plus doesn't make this bigger. Control shift, Control shift plus does, thank you. Uh, so here's that.jsteel.ca, and it's issued by Let's Encrypt's. Oh, is that the issuer? I thought that was the root. It definitely should not be here, should not sign by the root, so I guess that must be the issuer. Uh, and it's good for January 6th through April 5th. Um, I don't think I have time to actually install that in anything because we're almost at the hour, but uh, if you just look at the output, it tells you where you can find your keys. Oh, that's in the other window. You can find your keys um, in the Acme folder. Um, when this certificate comes up to expiration, list. there we go. You can see the uh, certs are issued, and um, yeah, when it, when you run the cron job, this is all that it runs. It just checks if any of your certs need to be renewed, and you can force them <coughs> if you want it to happen earlier. Um, one more tiny thing, I'll do a 
Nah, that's not time. Um, yeah, you can also just add more dash Ds and, and host names. And as long as all those uh, all those domain records, A records are pointed, or whatever, uh, that can ask me an A record. As long as it's pointed to the to this machine, it will be able to satisfy the challenge. There's other challenges that might be easier if you're, especially if you are, say it's on a NAS at home, you don't want people to get to that box. You can use a text record, so you don't actually need that machine to have any connectivity to the internet. Or maybe you do, but anyway, yeah. Question? Did you look into the blockchain? Because there's a classical case of property ownership transfer. Name coin. You want, you want the Like blockchain. Uh, are you talking for? For ownership transfer. Oh. Um, we didn't. <laughs> uh, we didn't look at blockchain for uh, our video solution. Any other questions? All right, thanks guys. Um.